Sierra Wands of Toronto. I'm Ariana Ruiz. I'm Renee Rocha. And this is Imagining Latinidades. This is Imagining Latinidades. I'm Daryl Wandra Serrano. Hi, Ariana here. And Renee is not here. Insert sad trombone. Two trombones. Uh, we are here doing our last show of uh, the semester and the calendar year. Uh, we are not going, our, our schedule would have us doing one more show on, on, uh, on, on New Year's Eve. Um, we neither want to stick around to record that show, nor do we believe many people will listen to that show. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to just do a small hiatus. Uh, and so this episode, which we're recording um, in the last regular week of the semester for us, um, and will air next week during finals week for us, um, uh, will be the last one of the year. And then the next episode to air will be uh, will be on January, uh, or sorry, on January 14th, uh, which is a special interview that I just did uh, uh, while she was visiting town with uh, Iris Morales, a former young lord um, and filmmaker, uh, an all-around awesome person. So the next episode uh, will air after the new year, uh, and we're just going to kind of be we're going to take a little bit of time off. We've had a really busy semester, which is part of what we want to talk about today. Um, and uh, and we've got still, you know, a, a lot to get ready for uh, for the coming year. So thank you for sticking around and listening to us. It's been awesome uh, hosting the podcast. It's been great to see feedback from people and uh, know that that people are listening to this. Um, I've, I've enjoyed doing this show a lot over the course of this semester. Uh, it was a pretty steep learning curve, uh, in different, in multiple mm -hmm. ways, uh, learning how to, uh, use different kinds of editing software, uh, and kind of learning all that from scratch, uh, to be able to produce these episodes, um, getting over, uh, hating my own voice, although mm -hmm. I still, I still do hate my own voice, uh, but I'm over the like fear that's involved with that and now i can just talk and accept that it is what it is yeah it feels like um this episode is somewhat of a a reflection episode right uh just in terms of the different aspects of imagining latinidades that we've um taken on um this semester and that will be going on next semester as well and so i you know echo a lot of what you say said um in relationship to you know, sitting in front of the mic is something that's very new to me and something that I'm still like, mm. <laughs> all right, this is what we're doing. OK, Ariana, get it together. Say the words. You know how to speak. Um, so, yeah, actually, when Iris Morales was in town, we got together for lunch with her and, and she mentioned the podcast. And I think I made a face where you were like, hey, what's that face for? And I was just like, I'm still not used to my voice and I'm still not used <laughs> to gathering my thoughts and sitting down and thinking through them. Um, but having said all that, I, I've really appreciated the conversations that we've also had um, amongst the three of us. Right. Because yeah. as we started off um, at the beginning of the podcast, we all discussed our, our own sort of trajectories and our histories in um, and within Latino, Latina, Latinx studies um, and how those perspectives have really informed the way that we look at our research, but also the way that we engage um, with the work before us. Right. Um, and so that's what's been really interesting for me to to sit down and um hear all these different viewpoints um, based on our own sort of disciplinary training yeah. um, come together. Yeah. Yeah. It's been really, that's, that's been really nice. You know, I think, I think we might've mentioned this in, in maybe our first episode um, that, you know, despite the fact that you, Renee and I have been meeting, you know, basically weekly since, uh, since a while ago, mm -hmm, right. For, mm -hmm. for over a year um, at this point, um, we like prior to doing the podcast, we didn't really get a chance to like talk about to really like talk about our thoughts on on things. Right. Right. We didn't get a chance to discuss how each of us was approaching, you know, questions of Latinidades and approaching these different research topics within Latino, Latino, Latinx studies. Um, and so it's been really nice to be able to sit down regularly um, 
talk about the stuff and to do so in a way that, that, uh, that also just, you know, happens to, uh, to kind of like fit into what we're trying to do with all of our campus programming mm-hmm. this year. Um, and, and hopefully to do so in a way that, uh, that is interesting, not just to other academics like us, right? Not just to other uh, people who are professors or maybe graduate students, um, but hopefully also to undergraduates um, and maybe even to people who aren't in college, right? To like mm-hmm. people's parents and family members, uh, because you know, the, one of the one of the goals for me with this show um, that that I that I know you know is still something that we have to. Uh, that we have to keep striving for uh, is to is to talk about these issues in a way that um, that is intelligible to non-specialist audiences, right? To people who are just interested in the topic, um, and this can be a kind of entry point uh, into understanding what it is that Latina, Latino, Latinx studies does, at least from our perspective here at the University of Iowa, and coming from the institutions and the backgrounds that each of us has. Right. And again, thinking about it. So we're here in Iowa, right? But we're all coming to Iowa from very different um, backgrounds as well. Right. And even here at the institution, we're talking about faculty that are at various stages in their career. Right. Um, And so, again, that's where I think I've really personally appreciated the conversations that we've had, but also in talking to folks um, that have listened in uh, thus far, that's, that's a part of it as well. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that I think is so um, particularly uh, special. And yes, I know I'm talking about our own podcast, (laughs) so not to toot our own horn, but um, I do think that there is something to be said for having folks at various stages from different backgrounds, different disciplinary trainings and political science, communication studies, literary studies, um, all of these things coming together to think through these ideas. And that's really what, um, brought us together to even start thinking about the different folks that would come out um, to the various events that we've hosted thus far, um, as well as the types of conversations that we've had with the podcast, um, as well as with the reading group, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's really like, at the end of the day, that's also, I think, what uh, Latino studies is for a lot of people in a lot of different institutions, right? It's, you know, most people are affiliated with Latino studies, Latina studies, programs and departments. Um, but few people ha- are kind of what I would say lucky enough to have that as their like full academic home. I mean, there's obviously mm-hmm. like institutions where that is the case. Um, but, you know, otherwise, you know, for, for I think most people, it's it's that affiliated status um, and and then, you know, the the program or the department. Um, or the institute or center, Mm -hmm. right, becomes that place of kind of, you know, that kind of intellectual home for a lot of people, that home space um, that we've, we've talked about before. Um, And so it's, it's nice to be able to like mirror that and also to kind of like talk explicitly about that from time to time over the course of, of this year. Totally. And being able to bring it into the classroom. And then from there, um, as you mentioned earlier to the community or, itself right yeah um so that that's looked and uh and been done in various ways whether it be through the film screenings um guest artists that have come in guest speakers things of that nature so yeah so yeah so it it does it feels very like okay you know part one done (laughs) uh so now we we get to kind of be like end of semester (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah, end of semester. Sigh. Uh, it's. I mean, it's been a very busy semester. You, know, you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned a bunch of the stuff that that we've kind of sponsored and and done, um, and and then we've also had you know three major speaking events. Mm-hmm. Right. We had an mm-hmm. opening conference that was a few days long, uh, and two one day symposia on top of the film. The other invited speakers and guests. Um, and, and that's been, uh, it's been a labor of love, but it's definitely been a labor right mm-hmm. over the course of the semester. Um, and one that, that, uh, that I'm really happy about the outcome so far. I mean, I think over the course of, of all those different events, um, I think we've had, oh, I, I, I'm not sure about the, the tally from the, um, from, uh, from the poet who was in, uh, but I would say somewhere around six to 700 people total at all of our different events over the course of the semester, which is great. I mean, that's, that's a ton of people, mm-hmm. 
you know, getting exposed to different aspects of Latino studies that, you know, that just the last year didn't get exposed to that. Right. Right. Um, and that's exciting to me because, you know, we're in our we're in our fifth year of having a, a Latino Latino studies program uh, uh, here at the University of actually our fifth year of having the minor um, and to be able to 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 see the growth in that program. I think we're over 60 declared minors at this point. Yay. Um, yay. Insert <coughs> hand claps. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, we've got over 60 declared minors, um, but we, we've got a rapidly growing uh, uh, Latina, Latino, Latinx student population mm-hmm. here at the university. Uh, and we've got a, a faculty that is, that is, uh, you know, across the college and the university that's still just, you know, just starting to be exposed to what Latino studies is and can be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's, it, it, I'm happy that we're able to play a role in educating people and in spreading the word about the value of this kind of programming here locally at the university. Yeah. And I hope through things like this podcast and, uh, and the, the videos of the talks, once those get online, they will be online soon. <laughs> they are, I think almost done. Uh, that that we're going to have a set of resources that are um, that are valuable to people at other similarly situated institutions, mm-hmm. right? Places where maybe they're just getting Latina, Latina, Latinx studies or ethnic studies or critical race studies off the ground, uh, but also more established institutions. I mean, my my hope, my hope all along has been that not only are these things useful in our local context here and help you know help educate Iowans about. Latina, Latino, Latinx peoples, history, cultures, et cetera. But also that uh, that the resources that we're producing are, you know, remain valuable after these events have, have finished, right? They're useful in our classrooms. They're useful in other people's classrooms. Um, and I think that, you know, that in terms of like the speakers who we've had through and the presentations that they've given, um, it, it's incredibly, it, they, they've all done such an amazing job at being accessible, uh, and and still maintaining the um, the kind of rigor of their research, uh, and in just doing so in a way that reaches out beyond the audience of a typical kind of academic conference, mm-hmm. um, and really kind of speaks broadly to uh, to to students and to other people in the community. Right, and one of the things that um, I know I've talked a lot about with my students um, has been this conversation around engagement and critical thinking, right? And the way that all of these different aspects of our programming have talked to one another, right? So even if we have someone coming in um, during that first event, there's conversations that were taking place that come up um, during the last event as well. Um, or again, with those uh, guest artists that are also coming in. Yeah. Um, so thinking about Jose Olivares, uh, the poet that you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, Citizen Illegal, there were lots of students that were like, oh, this is making me think of, you know, what we talked about with Suzanne Obler um, coming in or Gina Perez, things of that nature. That's what's yeah. really exciting to me to see those connections happening um, in real time in conversation. Um, one of the aspects that I've also really appreciated are so after we do the roundtables with um, the guest speakers for that mm-hmm. day for the symposium yeah. or for um, the opening conference, uh, there's been a question and answer session afterwards and that hasn't gotten recorded just because some of the conversations that come up um may be um in nature that that they stay in that room to a certain degree right yeah. um but i've really appreciated them right where we have had undergraduate graduate students people from the community that are asking these questions about um the state of latinidad Mm-hmm. And what does it mean? What does it look like? And pushing back on it, mm-hmm. um, engaging with it in all these different ways that that have been really um, exciting to see firsthand. And again, I, I think that what you were mentioning in terms of this material, this archive being around um, post imagining Latinidades, those are the types of things and conversations that will continue to generate, which I think is very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Pivoting to today, uh, to, to what we want to talk about on the podcast today, I think that there's, you know, we don't have a, uh, we don't have as precise of an agenda as we usually have, uh, because usually we're preparing for a group of people coming in. Um, but we want to continue this kind of, this kind of a mode of reflection that we've started off this episode with. Um, 
uh, and think about a couple of things and talk about a couple of things that I think would be of interest to people listening. Um, and you know, and then we'll, and then we'll call it a day. Mm-hmm. Um, the first thing I want to talk about uh, is I want to talk about favorite things that we've read this academic year. And I'll kick off on that. <laughs> so you can keep, keep thinking about it. Cause I know I just, I just sprung this on you um, a few minutes ago. Uh, so I think the you know, I, I was thinking about this the past couple of days, just uh, in part because I just had to go through and, and, uh, and choose and really like commit to a set of books for my graduate seminar next semester, which is on race and racism in the U S and so, and I wanted to include like a, you know, a, a healthy dose of Latina, Latina, Latinx studies, uh, scholarship in that class, especially since, you know, the our program is continuing next semester and I'd like for the students to attend, uh, the events that we're hosting. Um, and so, you know, thinking about like who, and we've had so many great folks come through town and their scholarship is just amazing. Um, and I tried to, to, you know, for most of the people who've come through town, I've tried to assign work, some of their scholarship to, uh, my undergraduates this semester so that they would have a chance to kind of read something from the, from people before they came to town. Um, and you know, one of the things that I assigned and, and I, and I'd read it before, um, and it was a, it was a, it was a favorite book of mine, uh, before, even though it's only like a year old. But I, but I'd still put it on my list again, and that's uh, that's Jillian Baez's book, "In Search of Belonging: Latinas, Media, and Citizenship." Um, I'm putting this on my on my syllabus for my grad seminar next semester. Um, I assigned just the introduction from the book to my undergraduates this semester, um, and really, I think ha- we had probably the best, most lively, and engaged discussion about a reading all semester. Um, you know, the, if you're not familiar with the book, um, you know, basically it, it, it combines, I mean, it combines a, a, a kind of cultural studies, sensibilities, and theoretical orientation uh, with really rigorous ethnographic field work um, and other kind of uh, social scientific methodology, methodologies as well as textual analysis uh, to make a set of arguments about how uh, Latina audiences in particular engage the media that they consume, right? And particularly how they engage in those practices of consumption uh, in a manner that illuminates their connection and that helps to kind of like map out their connections to citizenship. Um, and citizenship for her, right, means both uh, both the kind of what she calls material citizenship, right, which is what a lot of people typically think of when they're when they're talking about citizenship laws and 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 regulations and stuff, um, as well as symbolic citizenship, right, which are the ways that uh, that people kind of you know, conceptualize um, and articulate notions of belonging to the broader kind of body politic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, in, in assigning this, uh, the introduction for my students, um, you know, when I got to class, I wanted, you know, I want us to talk about some of the key terms a little bit. And we did that for, you know, we did that for a few minutes. Um, but then I, I just turned it over to them uh, because I wanted to know, like, what, examples stand out to them from their own experiences uh, of media consumption that really kind of you know, like connects up to her arguments about belonging. And first of all, they named off, you know, they, they mm-hmm. found shows and stuff that I did not even know existed because I'm a, you know, I'm a Gen Xer. <laughs> right. Um, uh, I didn't, you know, uh, for a lot of my youth, I didn't have Disney or anyway, there are a bunch of shows. I'm like, that, yeah, we had some fun with me saying that doesn't exist. You're just making it up. And they're like, no, 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 really. It's a, it's a thing. And they'd find a, a YouTube video for me. Um, and so, you know, basically, yeah, I had them, I had them find clips um, on YouTube and elsewhere online um, to, to show the class uh, and then to have a discussion about, how those, you know, how those examples that they were pointing to uh, speak to some element of what bias sets up in, uh, in In Search of Belonging. And it was just, it was amazing. Mm. It, it, not only did, uh, not only did they find examples that, uh, that I think, you know, could be in, 
could be great examples in another edition of this book that looks at, you know, an audience, a different type of audience, right? That's like, you know, Gen Z, you know, late millennial slash Gen Z uh, consumption of media. Uh, but, uh, but it taught me so much about them too, right? About where they're coming mm-hmm. from, about what issues were, you know, they saw as kind of important and that these different, you know, shows um, and movies uh, helped them to navigate. Uh, it, it was, it was just wonderful. It's, it's such a, it's such a, it's such a fabulously written book with such a rich archive of materials that she's drawing from. Um, I can't say enough positive things about it. Uh, you know, there are, there are good reasons why it has been receiving accolades from others, why it won the, uh, the, the Ritter award at the national communication association this last November. Um, and I think my graduate students are going to love it next semester. Right. I was going to ask you are, that's, that is one of the texts oh, yeah. that you'll be teaching in. Oh in yeah. Spring. Yeah. Just because it's, I mean, my, my department is, you know, is rhetorical studies and media studies mm-hmm. and interpersonal communication. I've got people enrolled in the class who are, who are coming from media studies as well as rhetorical studies. And I think that, I think she just does, you know, there are, there are not a ton of books that I think do both, the uh, the kind of like media studies and audience studies type stuff that she does along with the textual analysis mm. that's maybe more common to rhetorical studies. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a great fit for my course. And at the same time, it's not, it's not very disciplinary. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. I don't think that, I think that, 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 uh, that she's a fabulous interdisciplinary scholar um, and doesn't get bogged down in, discipline specific jargon in mm-hmm. her writing um which you know probably half of the class um it, are people from outside of my department mm. um so it's i like to be able to pick texts you know that have that con- have that connection to com studies but don't get bogged down in com studiesness right and i think that speaks to just even the presentation that she gave here oh, yeah, right yeah where it was very multimedia we got to hear some some music saw some music videos um as she was talking about these um different ways that uh latinos latina and latinx um folks have have found themselves within um supporting the current administration and pushing back on some of those ideas as well. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> you managed to say all that without without saying salsa song of Latinos for Trump. Right. Well, I tried to not say uh, his name if, oh, if, I, yeah, if sure, I can, sure. if I can avoid it. Sure. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm also going to um, think about, this question um, around some some greatest hits, shall we say, some things that we really enjoyed um, working through this semester. Oh, if we're going to do greatest hits, and I'll add a couple more. To well, the yeah, list that's too. why I was. I'm <laughs> I'm thinking about it through like this musical lens, of course, um, but I'm also thinking about it in terms of scale. I I, I like doing stuff on cultural geography, so I'm going to talk about it on scales. Um, so I think in terms of um, material that we've looked at within the semester, within the context of um, a class. Uh, This semester, I was teaching a grad course, Citizenships, Affect, and Belonging slash Unbelonging. Um, And one of the texts early on that we looked at was by Ana Sampaio. Um, It was uh, Chapter Security and Citizenship, Enemy Combatants, and the Case of John Walker Lind, Yasser Hamdi, and Jose Padilla. Um, I think that this... So backtrack a little bit when in that grad course, I have um, students from a variety of disciplines, um, as well as um, a number of international students, I would say the majority coming from Latin America um, that are in the Spanish and Portuguese department. And so when we're thinking about these questions of race and ethnicity within the U.S., for a lot of them, they're working through these ideas for the first time. Right. Um And I just really appreciated the way that the text um, so very clearly and eloquently uh, discussed these three cases to think about these questions of citizenship um, and rights that are there or not there for these um, various groups. And so I thought that that was a text that this is someone coming from political science as well, right? So 
perhaps a text that I would have not picked up um, quite readily again, if I'm coming from sure. literary studies, cultural studies, um, but definitely one that I thought was so great to contextualize some of um, the the debates and questions around citizenship that we would be bringing up throughout the semester. Um, and so on that day, we we talked about that text in relationship to Gina Perez's um, earlier work on uh, militarization, JROTC and Latino, Latina, Latinx youth, um, as well as thinking about birthright citizenship um, with Natalia Molina's work. So all of those things came together quite nicely um, to really think about this idea of um, of rights and what we assume comes with citizenship and how that is very different when we're talking about um, these questions of, again, ethnicity, um, nationalities and the way that you're read in particular mm-hmm. um, sort of judicial uh, settings. So I, I thought that that text was just really, really wonderful. And that's from uh, Terrorizing Latino Immigrants, right? Correct. That yes, book? yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is another fantastic text as a whole. Um, But that section in particular, I thought was really valuable for the types of conversations, like I said, that we would be having uh, throughout the semester. Um, I think when we're talking about sort of Latinidades in the Midwest, um, we looked at Karma Chavez's remapping Latinidad, the performance cartography of Latina, Latino identity in rural Nebraska. That was Mm -hmm. fabulous. I thoroughly enjoyed it, both as it brought in sort of performance studies, but also with someone in a field like community communication studies and really thinking about what Latinidad looks like Mm -hmm. in rural Midwest. Yeah. Right. And so those ideas of, again, a part of what we've been talking about throughout, um, even us really thinking through imagining Latinidades is the fact that we do have the the plural Latinidades, right. Mm -hmm. To really think about these various types of experiences, um, and the, the need to, place tension and move away from homogenizing Latinidad as one singular thing. Um, And so I thought that text brought up um, lots of interesting opportunities to really think about, well, how is it that um, our particular spatial location, um, particular time in our life, but also within the U.S. might inform the ways that we might um, feel attachments or decide to maybe not have attachments with this larger label Latinidad, right? Yeah. Um, so that was another text that I thought was was really um, important when framing it within um, our experience here in Iowa. So we have the Sampaio text at the beginning framing the conversation, uh, Chavez as someone who's thinking through it in a in in the Midwest. And then at the personal um, sort of scale, at the personal level, I thought uh, we worked through Maura Toro Morn's uh, Migrations Through Academia, Reflections mm. of a Tenured Latina Professor. Um, I It came at a time in, in the semester where I needed to read it. Um, so we closed out the semester in that course, uh, reading Claudia Rankin's Citizen. Um, and a part of what we, we talked about in relationship to even that text was like, you read it and you... If you get it, you get it and you get it at at sort of that personal like Uh scale. Right. Um, That's how it felt for me to read uh, Toro Mon's piece where I was just like her discussion about um, her experience as a Latina in higher ed, um, both within the classroom, but also within the institution itself was just one that I really resonated with me mm-hmm. um, at that personal level. Um, and one that I, I needed to read in, in ways that I hadn't necessarily anticipated yeah. um, till I was actually going through the experience and putting like little stars and, <laughs> and underlining <laughs> things and highlighting and wanting to cut it up and put it in my office things yeah. of that nature um so yeah so it's it like i said a lot of the texts that were brought into that course were results of um the symposium itself and really trying to get students to engage with the scholarship of the various people that were going to be coming into town mm-hmm. um but then thinking about how they're just were so important to the types of conversations that took place within the classroom and outside of the classroom um both at the intellectual and also just personal level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll add, I'll add one other, um, one other reading that isn't someone that we had come in, um, but is a a piece that I assigned. And, you know, I think I, I think I assigned it maybe too late in the semester. I think my, I think my students kind of 
you know, we're just kind of, it's, it's that point where they are trying to get their projects done and, um, are having a hard time, you know, get fired up yes, about a we reading. Know, we know. Oh yes. Um, <laughs> And that, you know, so that's that's uh, that's on me. Um, but it was a it was a chapter from um, Neil de Flores Gonzalez's "Citizens but Not Americans: Race and Belonging Among Latino Millennials." Yes. Um, and I assigned what chapter was it? It was I think the the yeah chapter two Latinos and the racial politics of place and space. Um, and I just gotta say, damn, like that's a fantastic chapter. Um, And I'm going to, I'm actually, I'm really, really thinking about making this um, the text for a first year seminar Mm. I'm going to teach next year um, for this new, uh, the Unidos uh, Living Learning Community. Um, It's not a long book. It's Mm -hmm. written super clearly. Um, Yes, I know that my students, that the incoming first year students aren't millennials, uh, but There's no similar book on Generation Z. Um, And it's and like, you know, really the kinds of things that uh, that she's talking about in the book and that and that the the people who she talked with whom she she spoke uh, in researching the book uh, are dealing with like these are the same issues that that we all deal with. on a day-to-day basis that I think are even ma- perhaps even more magnified uh, in a place like the Midwest. I'm shaking my head over here because yes, I think it's a gorgeous book. Um, so I also worked with the text um, and we did the last chapter of it. Uh, oh, Latinos awesome. as real Americans. And it, it's oh. just, it's great, right? It, it, touches upon so many things um, that we've discussed and looked at thus far in in ways that, as you mentioned, are accessible um, and are also pushing you to think about like this youth experience. Right. Um, Yeah. We have all these various like Pew Research uh, reports of, you know, by this time in uh, a generational history Latinos start to call themselves Americans versus Latino. But then we also have this like actual text that's really breaking that down to us and thinking through these questions of how do people belong? Um, how do they feel like they don't belong? How do they reimagine that type of belonging? Yeah. Um, and one of the things that your comment also brings up that I think is important um, for us to highlight in, especially as we are thinking about this episode as a sort of reflection mm-hmm. um, episode is the fact that it's I feel kind of like, for example, with um, my introduction to Latino, Latina, Latinx literature course, I only have 16 weeks. Right. Yeah. Who can I <laughs> include? How can I squeeze everything into that when I and, and in that sense, it very much feels like only 16 weeks. Right. 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 Um, and I think it's important to highlight that in relationship to just our the conference organizing as well. Right. Yeah. We we have limited amount of time um, and there's lots of different like scheduling things that come into play and mm-hmm. uh, both on our end, but also on, on other folks end yeah. where we wish we could bring everyone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but that can be difficult to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, yes, it, totally. Um, and I've been thinking about, you know, like, Oh, if we can, if we can find, yeah, if we can somehow find funding to, to, to do like, you know, more symposia in the coming years, like who else we'd be able to bring in and how we can keep this conversation kind of moving. Right. Exactly. Um, And I think that that's the thing, right? Like this is the beginning of several conversations to, to come. Um, And so really thinking about that as, as generating more thought, more ideas. Yeah. Um, things that we want to be more uh, cognizant of, aware of, push towards, move towards in, in the future as well. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the one other thing, um, the other kind of question I had, uh, agenda item, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we've over the course of the semester, we end up, you know, complaining about like, Oh my gosh, we've got so much grading and this and that. And, um, and that's all fine and good and true. Uh, but I thought maybe since this is our last episode, we, we, not just I think this, we were talking about this before we started recording. Uh, since this is our last episode of the semester, that maybe we could we could reflect back on 
uh, our time as as undergraduates mm-hmm. to offer some words of wisdom or or solidarity uh, to any undergraduate listeners of this show because you know first of all if you're listening to the show bully for you that's great uh, I love that you're listening to the show um, and this is like this is like this is a tough time of the semester right if you're in a semester system or um, or if you're still going on a quarter system. Um, you know, you're listening to this either during finals week or right after finals right. week. Uh, things are, you know, things are or have been just kind of busy and messy. Uh, and, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully there's like some positive stuff in there, too. Uh, but there's always going to be like that, you know, the kind of like uh maybe doubt or uh, or some regrets or like wishing that you'd done things a little bit differently. And like, that's good. Right. I mm-hmm. mean, th- there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with having those kinds of uh, those kinds of thoughts. Uh, I know I certainly still do. Um, but the important thing is, I mean, I think you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll start with, with mine. The important thing is to, uh, to, to keep those channels of communication open. Um, I think that one thing that I had the tendency to do as an undergraduate, um, and even to a certain extent as a graduate student, uh, was that sometimes I'd get so far behind or I, or I just kind of mess something up, uh, in a, in a kind of epic way. And rather than just like dealing with it, I would avoid it as Mm. much as possible. Right. Um, Maybe I still do this from time to time. Uh, and the, when you do that, when you just kind of like pretend like it didn't happen, sometimes, right, right. <laughs> sometimes that doesn't, sometimes uh-huh. that doesn't actually make it better. I mean, I think, you know, I, like, I, I think that most professors um, are fairly understanding. Uh, and I think that a lot of people will be willing to work with you uh, to help ensure that you're able to finish on a positive note, um, if you can just like get in there and talk to them, right? Um, I think that you know if you if if something happens and you don't finish a major assignment or something like that, uh, and you just like ignore it and never go talk to your professor, there's nothing that they can really do to mm-hmm. help you out there, right? You're just gonna you know you'll get a zero or whatever. Um, if you can just like go and talk to them, there's like a decent chance that you can work something out. Um, and I think especially if you're, you know, especially if you're a first generation college student, you don't know that, right? Mm-hmm. You don't, you don't have that knowledge passed down to you from your parents or older siblings or things like that. Um, but it's an important thing to know, like the more that you can kind of like be in communication uh, with, without like, <coughs> excuse me, without being like, overly demanding on your professors, but the more you can be in communication with them, uh, the, you know, the, the better they're going to be able to help you finish the semester, um, in a way that, that, that kind of meets or exceeds the goals that you've been setting for yourself. Um, if you just kind of like disappear, uh, or ignore the fact that you didn't turn in some major assignment or assignments, uh, then there's nothing really anybody can do. Right. right? I mean, you're just, you are just kind of stuck at that point. Um, but I mean, like I was not a perfect, I was not a perfect undergraduate student. You? <laughs> um, <laughs> by any means. Uh, you know, one, of, one of my professors, uh, gosh, I went back and, and, and gave a little talk at my, uh, you know, at, at the university where I got my bachelor's from. Uh, and his introduction was, uh, was basically like calling me out for my foolishness as an undergraduate. That's um, hilarious. Yeah. So in a room full of his students, he's like, let me tell you about Daryl. This guy. <laughs> um, uh, because, you know, when I talk about like, not just like ghosting your professor when something goes wrong, like that's because I did that as an undergraduate. Right. Um, and, you know, so that was as a, that wasn't even as like a first year student. That was a, that was as a senior. Um, so yeah, I mean, it happens. There is life after screwing up. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I was a first gen student. I didn't, I didn't know how to navigate some of those kind of 
institutional norms. Mm -hmm. Um, And even, you know, even in my fourth year as an undergraduate, I was still learning how to navigate that stuff. Um, So, so that's, that's, that's my bit of advice, you know, is like, keep those lines of communication open. Don't avoid, don't avoid problems. Try to like deal with them head on and stay in communication with your, uh, with your professor. Uh, Because, you know, like, I'll speak just for myself here. Like I want all my students to do great in the class. Like I, mm-hmm. I don't enter the semester wanting to have like a perfect bell curve, right, right? In terms of grades. Like if I could give all of my students A's, if all my students could earn A's in a semester, I would give all A's in the semester. Um, and so I want to do whatever I can do to help ensure that they're able to meet the goals that they have for themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, if they want to get an A in the class, I want to be able to provide the resources to help them do that. And I think that that's it, right? Like, what are your goals as a student and what are you doing to achieve those goals, right? Yeah. Because um, sometimes your goal isn't an A in a class. Right, right. <laughs> sometimes your goal is like, you know, I, I really just want to see in this class. And or I just like, want to survive yeah, this semester right. <laughs> and whatever that may look like. Yeah. And that's cool too, right? Yep, yep. Um, but I think that's also, that comes with that is like, all right, so how is it that I'm managing my time? Um, what are the things that I need to do in order to to survive if that's the thing that that you're wanting to do right um because i do think that that that's important as well to acknowledge right that that's there are those courses where we're just we're just trying to make sure we we make it to the end um yeah i think I, it's funny because so at iowa we had our fall break thanksgiving break and then we come back for two more weeks of classes right so it feels like the longest two weeks <laughs> ever yeah. um because you're like wait we're not done so um yeah it, i was telling my uh latino latina latinx lit class um because i get a lot of like first second year students in that class i'm like oh you all came back from thanksgiving break with such great haircuts right (laughs) they're like the hair might look good but we're dying inside (laughs) um but so i i yeah it's it's a tough time for for everyone i think um undergrad grad faculty as well i'm just like all right gotta get gotta get through it as well um but i think i would say um and it's somewhat along the lines of what you were talking about daryl um is that sense of being able to advocate for yourself um so that would be one of the things that's i would say advocate for yourself in the sense of um if there are things that are coming up it's better for faculty to know about it sooner rather than later we yeah. can help more at the beginning than we can at the end of a semester, right? And so even at this stage, right, where we're we're coming in for the final stretch, like if there's stuff going on, keep us in the loop. We don't need to know every single detail. Right. That's that's fine. Um in fact, we really probably shouldn't know every single detail all the time. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But at least let us know what's going on so that we can help us help you, right? <laughs> that, that, that's kind of what I end up telling, like, help me help you. <laughs> if I if I don't know things are going on, then I, I can't, there's nothing I can do about it, right? Is that Jerry Maguire? Is help it? me help you? I, I don't know. It's some movie. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, it, it could be that. Um, and then um, along those same lines, um, be kind to yourself, right? Watch how you talk to yourself. Um, I know, and I, and it's something that I still do to this day where if I'm working on something and I mess it up, I'm like, I meant And so then I'll go and do something else, but I'm just kind of, I'm trying to catch myself in those moments where I'm like dummy, um, where I'm talking, like having that sort of self-talk to myself, just because like, I, you're so much of what you're doing at the end of the semester is you like studying for an exam, writing a paper like it's so much on your own that you want to be kind to yourself and check in with yourself um mental health is real like make sure that that you're you're doing all of the things it's not only like staying healthy sleeping eating well all of those things but also making sure that you're like taking mental like breaks if you need them along the way um because those are all things that as first gen as you know and here i'm speaking about my own experience um coming to the university as a first generation student um from 
uh, you know, very traditional household. Those are things that we we didn't talk about. Right. And yeah. so to go through particular experiences and, and just kind of being like, well, what do I do? Who do I go to um, take advantage of those services that the university has? Because, th- again, that goes back to the advocating for yourself. Right. Other other folks do it. Other folks know to do that. Um, I think sometimes first gen folks don't. Yeah. So that that would be sort of my two things is to be um, advocate for yourself um, and to take care of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when the semester quarter's over, like, take a break. Breathe. <laughs> you know, yeah, yes. Breathe. Like, <laughs> you know, the new Star Wars movie comes out pretty soon. You can check out a movie. Right. You Disney can, Plus trial. Uh, yeah. Maybe that's the time to sign up for that free trial. Yep. You know, just like, like give yourself a little bit of a break away, like give yourself some time to just kind of like decompress and chill. Um, I think, I think it's especially true for like graduate students. Like I think graduate mm-hmm. students get, you know, there's like this expectation that's, that some people create for them or they create for themselves that it has to be like all work totally. all the time. Right. Um, and I think that like, you, you know, it, no, that, that that's a bad idea, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You need to give yourself a little bit of time away. I mean, you know, you need to give yourself a little bit of time away to like, just like get some perspective, mm-hmm. right? Like, especially if you're, maybe you just finished your first semester in graduate school. Maybe you just finished your last semester in graduate mm-hmm. school, right? Either way, you need to give yourself a little bit of, a little bit of a break to be able to step back and go, okay, that happened. <laughs> um let me like enjoy kind of non-work, non-academic right. life for a little bit, uh, and then you know have the perspective to learn from from what happened mm-hmm. um, and to get ready for the next for the next term. Gosh, and I think there could be like just a graduate student episode <laughs> with so much like the so many things that we've seen both like <laughs> during our own time but also on the other side right sure um but i think again i'm going back to sort of what i've i've told my graduate students especially through the course of the grad class that i was mentioning earlier um and it's really to yeah to take the time away to kind of develop even interest outside of the thing that you're doing because you are more than just a graduate student. Um, I think that you run the risk of entering dangerous terrain when all of your identity is just the academic one. Yeah. Um, So really cultivating those things, those relationships, those hobbies, whatever it is um, that you need in order to kind of be able to take a break. Um, because that's really important as well. Yeah. Yep. Completely agree. All right. Well, on that note, happy holidays, because it's going to be, you know, various holidays are coming up. So we're not going to talk to you for another month. Uh, but, you know, enjoy your time doing whatever you do in that time between the middle of December and the middle of January. Yes. Uh, when we return, it will be with uh, with that special episode um, that I recorded with Iris Morales when she was here visiting. Um, and you know, it's just a conversation between uh, she and I about, uh, about kind of like the formation of, uh, of kind of ethnic studies uh, in the university context of so talking about her history involved with some of those struggles in the city university of New York system. In the meantime, maybe you're just not, maybe you're just now starting to listen to this podcast. You have some time to be able to catch up, you know, catch up and listen to our, our past episodes. Um, you know, to do that, please subscribe to the podcast and on whatever platform uh, you use. We're available on, you know, on 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 Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, and basically any app or service that you would use to listen to podcasts. Uh, and if you feel so inclined, please also give us some high ratings or maybe even write a review uh, in this in this break period that we're having. Um, Furthermore, we'd love to hear your thoughts uh, about this or any of our episodes on Twitter. We're at Imagining Lat for the podcast, or you can shoot us an email at podcast at imaginingletdini.ace.com. Um, all that said, thanks so much for listening. Uh, please check the show notes for uh, the citations that we've mentioned here today. Uh, and yeah, enjoy, your, enjoy your, your break period. Happy holidays. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you.